All right, uh, welcome everyone. Today we have presented uh, for you uh, a session on EI Zero Resource Limited Area. Our guest is going to be Dr. Li Lai. Uh, I'll be uh, telling you about her bio. Uh, before that, we'll be sharing a, a question, four questions. Uh, to be given a certificate, you guys need to do 50% of the exams at least. You need to get correct in the 50% uh, of the exam. Uh, so without further ado, let me introduce you our guest. Our guest is Dr. Lilay Selassie. Lilay Selassie is an intensive care physician and has practiced in Maryland and Northern VA for the last 15 years. She cares for critically ill patients in both an in-person and telemedicine capacity. She has served as an interim director for her practice group, served as stroke director for her hospital, and served on a professional peer review committee for the hospital she works at. Dr. Lily uh, took a two-year hiatus for, uh, from this work to live uh, overseas in her country of origin, Ethiopia. While there, uh, she taught in the main teaching hospital in the capital at Saba as a volunteer clinical instructor of critical Critical Care Medicine to the newly established fellowship program in Critical Care Medicine. Dr. Lily Selassie serves on, Lily Selassie serves on several board related to the advancement and empowerment of women and children in Ethiopia in the U.S. Dr. Lily uh, obtained two Bachelor of Science degrees, Biochem and Cell Structure Biology at the University of Illinois uh, Champaign. Urbana. Uh, she obtained her medical degree from the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston, and she completed her medical residency in fellowship in critical med uh, care medicine at George Washington University. She completed a, uh, an MBA through the George Washington University in 2021, and she is currently engaged in uh, healthcare startups in Ethiopia. Um, to tell you a little bit about uh, yet in our this session is. Uh, prepared in, in collaboration between Yet Inawak and EMA. Uh, Yet Inawak is a volunteer uh, medical work. It works in the health promotion and uh, other areas like the CME. So today uh, we'll be preparing you this CME. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Lila, you can start your session. Okay, well, thank you for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, um, I was uh, asked to give a talk about uh, EICU, which is often uh, referred to as telemedicine, and I'll um, clarify for you some of those differences in today's talk and how it could potentially be implemented in a resource constrained settings. Um, I think you've heard enough about my background, but um, I will tell you a funny story that uh, has come up as the as the talk was being promoted. Um, apparently, there was some confusion about EICU as being ICU. Um, in the emergency room. That's not what EICU, act, in the pur purposes of this talk, that's not what EICU is traditionally known for. EICU is essentially electronic uh, communications within ICU settings uh, to improve patient care. So um, one of the fellows that's a, a wonderful attending at Black Lion Hospital asked me, what does this talk about? <laughs> and I was surprised at, about the confusion, but things get lost in translation. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit, let me see how to move forward here. Um, so today's talk, we're gonna talk about the problem that led really to the creation of uh, EICU, um, what current telemedicine you may already be using um, in Ethiopia and in all parts of the world, um, how that differs from EICU, um, how from a staffing perspective an EICU uh, would be set up. Um, it looks like someone raised their hand. Dr. McConan raised his hand or her hand. Is there a question? Yes, um, maybe it could be uh, an error. Uh, we'll be facilitating it after the session, maybe. Okay, that's fine. I, I don't mind if people ask questions during the course of the talk, so I'll let you guys decide how to moderate that. Um, it, can everyone hear me okay? Was that maybe why the hand was raised? I just wanna make sure my audio is adequate. I think the audio quality is good. What we usually do okay. is uh, let the okay. questions come later after the session, so it will be easy to facilitate. Yeah, we'll do that. Okay, 
no problem. And if you have really pressing questions, please put them in the chat and that way it'll be saved for the end of the talk. Um, we'll talk about the benefits of EICU as a method for patient care, the deterrence uh, for implementation, what the potential is for the tool, and then how do you manage it um, in resource constrained environments. Um, so why is there um, EICU in the first place? Why was it invented? And, and the reality is there are more patients over here on the left-hand side of the screen requiring critical care services as technologies for prolonging people's lives in very sick conditions has increased. The amount of ICU bed requirements has increased, while at the same time, the number of ICU doctors, which in uh, the US we refer to them as intensivists, um, well, that number has not increased. And so the mismatch of uh, uh, supply to demand is really uh, the, the genesis of why uh, we initiate, there was an initiation of using um, telemedicine. So the next question is, who is currently using telemedicine. And I would submit that basically everybody has used telemedicine who's in clinical practice because telemedicine can be as basic as picking up a telephone or using your mobile phone and contacting someone who has training that is um, outside of your area of expertise and you're asking for advice. That is the basis, the fundamental basis of telemedicine. It's consultation with someone who's not physically in a space. Um, how does that differ from EICU? So EICU is really advanced audiovisual um, tools um, and integration with electronic medical records and a command center where ICU nurses and doctors are monitoring large numbers of patients all at the same time. So I'm gonna show you a brief video. Uh, you can find this on YouTube very easily um, about uh, EICU um, and I will, Pause it intermittently just so you kind of see. So that's how the that button, that first button you saw is the call button for uh, from the patient room into the EICU. This picture here is a uh, audio video camera that will take information from the room and feed it back to the tele ICU center. I have Mrs. Jones here. She's 30 years old. She just came to me from the emergency room. At FHN Memorial Hospital in Freeport, Illinois. Any pain going down your arm or equitable. So this is an intensivist who is seen by the patient um, and the patient uh, and then the, the doctor, the intensivist, is also able to see the patient through that camera I showed you earlier. Not everyone chooses to turn on the camera who's the EICU doctor because they may not want that level of uh, anonymity breached. But the standard is, you know, if the patient is able to see you uh, because they're not intubated and heavily sedated, you would turn on um, your camera. Um, and you can see she's in an office space. She's not in any uh, usual clinical space with other patients. No, I just, I feel pressure in my my chest. Intensive care patients are getting an extra layer of care from experts 65 miles away. Critical care doctors and nurses at UW Health in Madison, Wisconsin, are monitoring the patients 24 hours a day, seven days a week with an electronic ICU program called eCare of Wisconsin. Pain in your arm, going up into your neck. I tell all my patients and their families, you have the advantage of physically being in Freeport, which is convenient for families, but you really have one leg here and one leg in the ICU at UW. So just if you notice, you know, the doctor has, uh, I think, six to eight screens up at one time. Um, this is to multi monitor multiple patients and their um, physiologic parameters. Um, there's a video one. There's the, the um, vital sign monitor, continuous vital sign monitoring. Um, there's access to the electronic medical record. Often the electronic medical record has embedded within it um, radiology images that they'll open up. Often that will go into a separate screen. Um, but this is literally, it's across state, state lines and it can really be across the ocean. So there are, there are physicians that are based in Israel that are monitoring patients in the United States. They're continually monitoring our patients, but not assuming they care. So if I come into the room and I'm thinking, oh, something isn't right, I can push a button and get another person immediately in the room. So notice she says another person. She doesn't say the ICU doctor. 
Okay, it's not possible if you're monitoring 135 patients or more for that doctor to be available at the push of a button. But that's why this, the units are also staffed with ICU nurses. And often the question is really a nurse to nurse question. It's not even a nurse to doctor question. So this allows for appropriate triaging even in the ICU, EICU setting. You look at your blood pressure, your pulse, your temperature, your blood work, your lab work, everything on the computer that I can see, including my notes, the notes of the cardiologist, et cetera. They have full access to everything. And with the use of two-way video cameras, the experts at UW Health can interact with caregivers in Freeport, as well as patients and families, within seconds. A lot of my interactions are with the nursing staff, but also really anybody who comes into the room and is involved in patient care. What I find very gratifying is being able to talk to the patients directly sometimes. The other aspect is the ability to voice opinions and provide information to the patient's families that's so critical in the settings. The UW Health Critical Care Physician. So here you have um, uh, a nurse. Uh, everyone here is a seasoned professional. So this is not a recent graduate from ICU uh, nursing care. There, there are people with generally at least 10 years of experience on the nursing side. And then um, you can have a relatively new intensivist to do this, but generally it's someone who's also had some clinical bedside experience for an extended period. The nurses can also provide a wealth of experience that comes with seeing a high volume of critically ill patients. We've seen these septic or sick patients hundreds of times. And so when you look into a room, even from a video or from looking at their medical records and visiting with the patient, you just get a sense of their illness. We enjoy having that expert uh, set of eyes looking at our patients. Our so notice that there's actually a doctor still required at the bedside. It's just not someone whose specialty is critical care medicine. Most critically ill patients are able to stay in their neighborhood. Their families have a you know short distance to travel, and they're receiving the benefits of having the UW collaboration with FHN to provide care. So a little extra oxygen might help you feel better. So and one of the other things that we saw was that our patient's recovery time also was shortened as well, which adds to that theory that in addition to providing exemplary care, one of the most important things that we shouldn't understate is family support right there at the bedside. In addition to providing enhanced patient care, the eCare program at W Health also serves as a valuable recruiting tool for community hospitals looking to hire and retain staff. I think when we are talking to nurses who are interested in working here and we're able to tell them that we have. So I'm going to um, stop the video there. There's a, a lot of uh, recruiting stuff after that, which we don't need to see. Um, so let me just minimize this and we'll go back to the PowerPoint. Um, so what are the components uh, for EICU? So on the tele-ICU side, which is that command center where the doctor and nurses were sitting with, you know, each having six to eight screens, um, they're accessing the following information. They're able to access the electronic medical record of the patient. They're able to view using the um, audio video feed, uh, the bedside monitors, ventilators, um, there's a video conferencing system so that the nurse and, and the patient or the patient's family can see the um, see the uh, um, EICU doctor or at least hear them at a minimum. And then also the ability to access images is also crucially um, important in this setting. Um, and then in the in the in, in the middle section here, we talk about what's required in the patient room. So this is at the very high end of things, like you know, an in-ceiling camera with a microphone, an integrated audiovisual TV, a tele-ICU call button. You don't need all of this, and I'll, I'll go over that. And then this is just what's required in every ICU uh, level. You know, every ICU should really have a ventilator and the ability to give uh, different um, uh, infusion, um, meds through infusion uh, pumps. Um, these other items here, dialysis, balloon pump, ECMO, these are not required at all facilities, but certainly tertiary facilities would have these um, available. And then you have that command center, which in the slide they refer to as a central operation center. And so you have a staffing for that um, command center, which is the intensivist, um, advanced practice nurses, 
uh, nurses in critical care. And then you also have a workflow that says, okay, which patients are gonna be admitted? How is the process of that look like? And how do we respond to uh, pathophysiology? And how do we interact with both the um, ICU and their protocol, the, the ICU that we're serving in the EICU setting? And then also you have to be able to access the EMR remotely so that you can order put in um, orders. Um, the other crucial points are that you have to have a way to manage the information management system. So the EMR needs to have data encryption security. Um, it needs to be tested periodically so it doesn't go down so you can actually access these things. And it has to be validated as a viable information management system. And then lastly, um, in terms of analytics and reporting, this is really about like integrating best practices, um, research that's available. So during the COVID pandemic, the EICU that I work at um, was responsible for um, identifying patients that were eligible for different um, dr drug trials that were uh, being offered at that particular hospital. So once they were identified, they would uh, mark that patient as eligible to be enrolled in the trial. And then the um, people running the trial would then come and um, enroll those patients as appropriate if the family agreed. It's also a way to have quality assurance um, brought into place, and I'll give you some examples of that. And the other big thing is on the utilization of the resource, right? Is, is you is EICU being used appropriately? So if the answer to that is no, then you're not going to see some of the benefits that can be um, gained from the EICU. So, you know, what do you have to have then in a resource constrained setting in order to provide EICU? And, and what I'll argue, the real benefit is that you, there's a limited number of ICU doctors in Ethiopia or other resource constrained areas. I was, I was fortunate enough for a couple of years to be involved with the training, but you're talking about, you know, there's one major center, Black Lion, where the training happens. And there's on average, you know, four fellows graduating a two-year program in pulmonary critical care. So even over 10 years, you're still talking about only about 40 um, doctors have been trained, which is a lot better than when it started. You're, when it started, you're looking at more like four doctors for the entire country. So this is a definite improvement. None of them had critical care specific training. Um, so th there is improvement, but it's still not enough to cover all the, um, you know, the requirements of and needs of the country. But resource constraints happen in every setting. They happen in the United States. They happen in very wealthy countries. And the reality is that there is more demand for services than there is people to provide those services. And so EICU is a way to give basically a broader set of people access to care. Um, but you still need bedside staff, right? If I determine as the EICU doctor that a patient needs to be evaluated for intubation, um, I still have to have someone at the bedside to intubate the patient, right? I can help out um, by identifying that that's the next step that needs to happen. Anesthesia is much more likely to show up um, when I call them to intubate the patient than when the bedside nurse calls them because they know already a physician has evaluated the patient. Um, but the that bedside staff is crucial. So you need to have someone who has ICU skills to work uh, in that in the hospital. They don't have to be an intensivist. The intensivist can be in the EICU setting, but someone who can do advanced airway management and an ICU nurse as well as the equipment. Um, you need to have EICU staff, right? So that's the intensivist and ICU nurses um, to uh, work in the command center to advise the people at the bedside. Um, you also have to have protocols for engagement, and so we'll talk about that, but um, if there's a patient who, during the day, there's a whole bunch of stuff that happened for the patient care, and at night, the telemedicine doctor is helping the bedside doctor manage the patient, there has to be a protocol to say how much involvement should the EICU doctor have and how much involvement should and how much should the bedside team have. And the more the EICU team is empowered to act on quality metrics, on um, direct patient care, on admissions, you have much better patient outcomes. But that that requires some level of um, protocols for that engagement. You have to have um, AV equipment. And so I'll show you some ideas around how you can do um, from, you know, instead of that big command center and the, um, you know, the built-in monitoring systems, how you can um, go about doing it uh, with um, tools that we were using during the pandemic ourselves that are much more affordable. Um, and then 
those will mainly focus on um, app-based approaches, mobile phone-based approaches, and then um, tablet-based systems um, that are mounted for AV systems. And that is a lower cost that provides um, still mobility and movement without the, someone having to physically hold um, your tablet in place so that you can, um, but you do need someone in the room to move it to look at the screen that you want. The way that the first uh, video showed that um, camera is actually controlled from the command center. So the ICU doctor in the command center controls the camera and can scan the whole room. So what are some examples of um, use of telemedicine in resource constrained settings? And so um, this comes from a study in Nepal where they had non-physician healthcare providers um, being uh, trained to use an app to diagnose uh, epilepsy. And in that context, they had no false diagnoses using the app in order to connect them to uh, neurologists. Um, in Botswana, they've used um, uh, multiple specialties, have used telemedicine for uh, mobile phone-based apps. So if I was the intensivist and I saw these images in the EMR, I would say, okay, this patient is someone who needs a neurosurgical consult, but the neurosurgeon does not need to come in immediately, right? So then they can call a neurosurgeon, the neurosurgeon can look at the, um, the image studies, and unless the patient is comatose as a result of this, they don't need to go to the OR immediately. As opposed to this image where I see, you know, mass effect, midline shift greater than um, one centimeter, that, that's a patient who actually needs to go to the OR urgently, right? And so the ability to view the images or the labs, that's all pretty crucial. Um, yes, you can verbally tell people those things, but it's much uh, easier to integrate all that information into clinical decision-making if you have access to it in the, um, you know, in the, in the, context of the, a, a good setup for an EMR. Um, also in Botswana, in addition to imaging for um, uh, radi uh, radiology imaging, they also used it for dermatology. They used it for cervical cancer screening. Um, and then what's been interesting about these smaller scale programs in uh, is that and you know, it's very similar to how a lot of business happens is that if you start small scale and then expand from there, it's generally much more successful than starting large scale from the top down. So if in Botswana, when they saw this, actually the government took it on and said, we should expand this program. But initially it started off as a small scale program for proof of concept and then expanded from there to say, yes, this is worth implementing in settings where it's been a top-down approach from Ministry of Health or other government agencies and say, saying, you have to have um, telemedicine available for these patients, you know, it's not been as effective um, because it's hard to implement that so broad-based and often um, endeavors get started and then not completed. So here are some ways to reduce some of those costs. So um, this is a cart to hold a tablet. This tablet happens to be an iPad, but other companies make um, tablets and the iPad, um, the latest version of the iPad runs about $700. So on a per patient applic use, you don't need this to sit in every patient's room because it's on a cart that has wheels. This is a very effective tool. And actually we used this as a method during COVID for families to communicate with patients because there were no pa there was no visitation allowed by families, so we would just turn on the um, camera here uh, using a, a telehealth system. I think we even actually just used FaceTime. Um, ultimately, we also put WhatsApp on here. Um, are there concerns about HIPAA and patient privacy when you use those apps? Absolutely, but when you weigh sort of the benefit to the patient and their families against some potential loss of privacy um, from not completely secure um, methods of transmission, um, we felt that the risks um, were outweighed by the benefits. And then this cart, um, you know, online, you know, this mobile cart that has wheels and a gooseneck, uh, um, uh, a gooseneck adjustable arms so you can, you know, direct where the tablet's looking uh, manually. This whole thing costs um, $46. So it's very affordable. Um, it, you know, on, if you think about like, a, I think at Orambasa there, it, it's like a, maybe a 10 or 12 bed ICU when I was last there. Um, it may have gotten bigger since then, but um, 
you know, you, you don't need one at every patient space. If you had two or three of these in that ICU, you could make a lot of difference um, for the patients. And so in the middle of the night, if there's someone monitoring the patient who has less experience in critical care, then they could um, be in touch with somebody relatively easy. And then that person can look up information in an electronic system. You also have app-based approaches. So in um, Sweden, there's actually a company that is um, started to make uh, a telehealth um, app for uh, it's called Cardo Health that, that um, is making a telehealth based app for um, uh, low resource settings um, so that it's still an affordable setting. And then there are organizations like the World Telehealth Organization that also um, have basically volunteer physicians um, in uh, less resource constrained areas staffing on a volunteer basis. And then they, um, the company, I think it's called Telecan or Telecado, um, delivers like a, a robot based solution um, that's got a camera and everything mounted on it. Um, and in settings where some of the treatments are quite um, time sensitive. So I think the most time sensitive uh, thing that people can act on in almost any setting is sepsis, right? So the longer you wait to give patients appropriate antibiotics and resuscitate them, the higher their mortality. And it approaches something like 10% per hour that you, you miss that window to give appropriate care. So, um, you know, the ability to have someone assist the bedside team in how to manage those patients or, you know, do we think they're adequately volume resuscitated? Do we think they need to be intubated? If you don't have any experience in this, it can be overwhelming. And if you do, um, it, you know, it's something that you can easily help someone walk through. Um, okay, so let's talk about some of the benefits. So one of the big benefits is that an intensivist can um, staff multiple hospitals. So in our setting um, in Northern Virginia, in the evenings, um, the EICU doctor is staffing about um, five different hospitals. And uh, during the COVID pandemic, the command center ramped up to, to have daytime staffing as well to manage all the patients that were critically ill throughout the um, hospital system that uh, that I participate with. And that um, that group of uh, patients then had, you know, 24 seven access to um, an intensive care doctor. There was research done uh, back in uh, like 2006 by Peter Pronovos that looks at the leapfrog data that shows that at least in um, academic centers, having a 24 seven intensivist program leads to improved survival outcomes. So that's where a lot of this push for 24 seven care came. Probably in lower acuity settings, it's not needed, but it's been extrapolated as a result of that. Um, you have to have an audio video feed to relay medical information effectively. Otherwise it's telemedicine, it's not really EICU. Um, you must still have a patient care provider at the bedside. So in a lot of settings, it's now advanced practice um, nurses or physician assistants who've done additional training in critical care for one to two years in order to manage that. And then when they feel like they're in over their head, they have a, a EICU doctor who's an intensivist available for them. Um, you can have carts for remote exams. So often what will happen in an emergency room setting is we have carts that are used for neurostroke for telemedicine. And that allows neurologists to do a remote NIH uh, stroke scale exam and make an assessment if the patient would benefit from uh, medications or interventions that are time sensitive. Um, you can also have timely consultations with other subspecialties um, as a result of this. So, um, and, and timely updating of um, families. So I'm gonna just sort of tell you a little bit about how that has um, impacted me um, in a, as a provider. Um, when, uh, you know, when I had a patient who came in who was becoming septic, I sent them off for additional imaging exams. This is all remotely, they came back. And it, the, they clearly had an acute abdomen, had to go to the OR. And so I was then able to call the surgeon in and um, the OR team in to take the patient to the OR urgently. And that patient survived that hospitalization. And you know there are other times when I'll look at a radiology image post-intubation and I see the patient has a pneumothorax. I see they're on a ventilator. If I keep them on the ventilator, they're likely to develop a tension pneumothorax, which is obviously a life-threatening condition. And so then we you know, make the team at the bed 
bedside aware that we need to do follow-up imaging, um, put in those orders. And then in, in that setting, the radiologist hadn't initially picked up the pneumothorax on the first imaging study and it was picked up on the second imaging study. Um, and then also this is, I think, one of the most valuable things is that families feel like they have ongoing access as the, because the, the acuity of these patients is rapidly evolving, right? Just because they got admitted um, during daytime hours doesn't mean that their medical needs don't continue through evening hours. And so what will happen is if we see a patient is deteriorating rapidly, we will often um, update the family uh, and say, you know, are these the appropriate things? Are these the wishes of the patient that we continue with aggressive measures? That may you know, vary obviously uh, in a resource constrained environment, but I would submit that you should at least have those questions, um, those discussions with family members. And when they hear from the doctor that provides them some level of reassurance about the information that they're receiving. Um, let's see, what else did I wanna to share with you there? Um, okay. So how do we achieve the benefits that we're describing? And so the first is you have to have, even within the EICU setting, you have to have basically a pyramid approach with the top being the intensivist. And then as you work down, you have ICU nurses take, take, looking continuously, several of them looking continuously at a set of patients. And then you have um, often some uh, secretarial support just to help answer phones and triage calls, okay, do you want to speak to the doctor? Do you want to speak to the nurse? And that'll help um, with the management of um, the incoming request to EICU. Um, you also have to have education and support from the EICU nurse. There's seasoned nurses, and so often the bedside nurse, who could just be a fresh graduate out of training, um, gets additional support and education as to how to do her duties as the bedside nurse. Um, the ICU nurse often also reviews standards of care, makes sure that, make sure that the checklists of critical care, which are the non-glamorous portions of critical care, but are the areas where we can really make benefits in mortality for patients, that those things are being adhered to and where they're not, bring those to the attention of the ICU, EICU doctor to implement those checklist parameters. Um, and then you have to have a sign out of some level. It can be a written sign out with a focused sign out on the higher acuity patients. Um, it can be just a written sign out. If there's no high acuity, it can be you get a sign out on everyone with a longer emphasis on the patients who um, need act, you know, actions taken on uh, during the evening. Um, and you have to have some level of agreement uh, as to how much there is going to be adoption of telemedicine. Where telemedicine really fails uh, and EIC really fails is where there's been an administrative commitment and investment in this process. And there's been no sort of collaboration between the EICU system and the bedside um, doctors. Because then there's a lot of, oh, I know how to manage the patient, I'll manage them and just wait until I get back in the, in the morning or wait until I'm back, whatever time that is to take care of the patient. Meanwhile, the patient still has ongoing needs. And so that's a much less optimal situation. The more involved the EICU can be in the ongoing needs of the patient, the better the outcomes of that patient. So adoption is really that the, um, the EICU system and its benefits are well explained ahead of it coming into a hospital system. I will say like in our experience, what we found is that um, when the um, compensation bonuses of physicians were tied to the quality metrics, then those physicians became much more willing to have um, EICU participate because it just meant there were things they didn't have to focus on exactly during the day um, or during the time that they were present. And the EICU team would manage that so that the compensation bonus of that bedside physician was not negatively affected. But prior to that, in a setting where the um, patients, uh, you know, the, the bedside physician does not really want the uh, intensivist at the in the telemedicine setting involved, you, you had much worse outcomes. And all that kind of really emanates from what I describe as a patient first kind of priority, right? It's not about the fact that I put in that order or, you know, the other doctor put in that order, it's, are we doing the right thing by this patient? And so if that's the approach of your institution, as opposed to it's more important that I'm right as the, this physician than you are right, you, you have better outcomes in that setting as well. So is there data to support the benefit of EICU? So 
A lot of this looks at ICU mortality numbers. Um, EICU has definitely been proven to reduce length of stay both in the hospital and in the ICU. It's been proven to reduce ICU mortality. It's not been shown to cause necessarily uh, an improvement in all-cause mortality because it's not used outside of the ICU. So outside of the ICU, you have to have other systems in place to have improvement in outcomes. But at least in the ICU setting, you can have improvement in survival outcomes. So this starts back, um, this, these set of studies come back um, with a 13-year study in 2011 that showed a significant reduction in um, mor ICU mortality um, among uh, 35 ICUs and 27 hospitals, um, looking at over 41,000 uh, patients. Another study in 2012 also showed similar benefits. Um, again, this looks at these are uh, reviews of, uh, of up to nine studies um, over about a two-year period. There's another study from McIntosh that looked at the statistically significant reduction in ICU mortality in two different studies that occurred over three years. And again, large cohorts over you know, almost 6,300 patients also significantly reduced um, ICU mortality. Um, with you know confidence intervals that do not cross one, um, and then most recently the uh, author uh, recognized that Chen had a 10-year study that looked at 110 ICUs, uh, reviewed their more ICU mortality data both pre and post implementation of IC, uh, EICU, and they saw a significant reduction in ICU mortality um, in these studies. So you know what I would say is that if you go into these studies a bit more, where you see the real benefit is in settings that uh, have a lot of adoption to the use of the services of an EICU. It's similar to um, mandatory ICU consultations or what would we term closed ICUs, which is that the intensivist is really leading everything in an ICU. Um, those patients have uh, improved mortality as well. So what are the deterrents? So these are real deterrents, right? Um, the first is uh, financially based, right? The first year implementation of a telemedicine program of the kind that you saw in Wisconsin um, is fifty to one hundred thousand dollars per bed in the first year. Um, those costs are, emanate from equipment, which is both hardware and software. Those rooms have to be rewired essentially, and all that hardware needs to be put in. And then you have ongoing software, both the installation, the training, and the maintenance of that software. You also have um, staffing, um, increased cost of staffing, right? You have now added an additional intensivist, although that cost is amortized over multiple facilities, making it much more affordable. Um, and you have uh, more um, staff from a nursing perspective and a secretarial perspective. But there, you know, there have been um, institutions that have studied uh, the uh, investment in the large capital investment relative to the benefit. And if you look at large academic centers, Emory, I think, showed a like $4.5 million per year savings in ICU um, costs uh, lost from the institution after they, uh, not lost to the institution after they implemented EICU. Um, and then the other deterrent we had already discussed, discussed a bit, which is the acceptance of the bedside uh, providers, both the doctors and the nurses, um, into adopting the use of uh, EICU. So if you have your nurse constantly calling the EICU and getting help as needed, that's much more effective than not calling. Uh, and in another place where I'm now working clinically at the bedside, they have a hybrid system where the cardiac surgery patients who usually have more acute um, medication or medication and physiological parameters to monitor um, and usually requires some experience a little bit more than just um, doing a critical care fellowship. It requires additional um, training with post-op hearts. Uh, and new admissions are handled by the overnight in-house intensivist. But then the rest of the 36 bed unit, and so that may account for like six to eight patients. And then the rest of the um, 36 bed unit is managed by um, the EICU physician and nursing staff at a different command center. Um, again, we talked about rates of adoption, low level having um, worse uh, efficacy for the benefit of EICU versus high level. So what is the potential of really where we can be using um, 
the EICU um, to have improvement in patient outcomes moving forward. So one is it's an expansion of a pyramid based staffing model. Um, COVID is not going to be the last pandemic that we see. Um, and so it made us sort of start using this tool very aggressively in the United States. Um, and actually even in Ethiopia, you were using telemedicine. People were calling the intensivists they knew or the doctors they knew who had ventilator management skills and saying, how do I manage this COVID patient, right? And so everyone is using the limited resources or the you know expanded resources, but they were all limited for everybody during the pandemic, they were all limited. And so it often happens in a pyramid style structure, not this pyramid, we'll come back to that in a second, but a pyramid style structure is you have basically one intensivist can manage up to a hundred patients. And it's that you have that intensivist um, guiding a group of ICU nurses, that group of ICU nurses then guides a group of floor nurses. And in between those two nursing cadres, there are um, non-ICU physicians that are executing orders and starting to learn how to manage critically ill patients, right? And so that's how one doc manages over 100 patients. Um, you can see that pyramid in the Society of Critical Care Medicines uh, documents. Um, you can also reduce the cost of the deterrent that we talked about. Um, we talked about you could have a $100,000 system, um, which is really uh, Philips, who's the leading provider of EICU um, hardware and software in the US. They are, um, that's how much their system costs. But when you have alternate systems that are app-based, mobile phone-based, mounted on a mobile um, cart that's you know under $50 cart, that still gets you a long ways to where you need to provide um, the talent uh, uh, and training of an intensivist to the bedside of someone who does not have an intensivist. Um, you can also have a reduction in staff exposure, right? So in the setting of um, a patient who is uh, intubated, that, that cart can still be used by the bedside nurse to say, hey, can someone go get me some equipment, right? And so, or can someone go get me some medications? So they don't have to constantly leave the room and use what limited PPE they have and their time more importantly to um, execute the plan of care. Um, and there's also a timely response to deterioration, uh, which, um, you know, in the setting of the number of patients that I get, I was getting called about like, hey, can you take a look at this patient? Is this someone who um, I don't like the way they're breathing? And then, uh, you know, within, you know, a few seconds, I can be on a camera looking at that patient, even if it's a few minutes, it's much better than, you know, I'm not sure what to do. I don't know who to call for help. Um, you can often say, well, maybe this is someone we could try on non-invasive ventilation for a little while, BiPAP, CPAP. And then if that doesn't work, then we move them into a, a status of intubation at that point. And then there's also the use of um, predictive algorithms. So predictive algorithms basically take the patient data from the EMR and your conversation with the patient or their family and the bedside team. They take the physiological parameters that we are monitoring from the patient room and then you look at the clinical risk factors of the patient, and then you have clinical decision support tools to say, okay, is this someone who would require the next set of interventions? And those things together help you decide, this is someone who's going to deteriorate. And this is actually can be built into your app, right? Where the app looks at the patient data, the risk factors of the patient, the physiological parameters, and says, okay, what clinical decision support tools would apply in this setting? Um, the most common example where this is used is the decision around, is this someone who should have a sepsis protocol, a sepsis bundle initiated, right? And so um, you look at the parameters that define sepsis, you say, do they meet those parameters? And you look at the clinical risk of that uh, patient and say, is it appropriate to do aggressive volume resuscitation, initiation of antibiotics, you know, are those appropriate things? And there's a whole, you know, bundle for sepsis. That's the clinical decision support tool. And then you decide, okay, is this someone who is septic or is this someone who's actually having a PE and that's a reason for shock and therefore I should maybe approach it differently. So that's where all that data gets bundled and then presented to the intensivist, um, or the provider who's in the EICU setting to then say, yeah, this is someone who we need to escalate um, based on the clinical decision support algorithms we have in place. Um, so I just 
want to go over kind of what we've discuss discussed. We've talked about the problem um, that led to the use of um, initiation of telemedicine in the first place, how EICU looks different um, than uh, traditional telemedicine, what requirements um, you need to really be an effective EICU, um, how you could use tools that you already have in hand to do that. And you're, you're probably already doing that to some extent, right? I'm, I'm sure some of you have turned the camera on your mobile phone and trained it on a patient to someone who you're trying to get advice from and say, hey, is this, is this something that you could help me answer? Is this a problem you could help me answer? Um, we've talked about the benefits in particular in ICU mortality uh, and um, hospital length of stay and ICU length of stay. Um, we've talked about the deterrence, which are largely both financial and the adoption or lack thereof once a system is implemented. And then we've talked about its potential, how it can be used to identify at-risk patients, and then from there decide if critical care interventions are needed and appropriate or not. I mean, there's a lot of times where we look at the clinical risk factors of a patient in the ICU and say, okay, actually escalation of care is not warranted because this patient is going to have a bad outcome despite us attempting to escalate care. So in conclusion, I'd just like to have you focus on the idea that you know EICU is just another tool in your toolbox, right? It's not going to be the panacea, the cure-all for everything. Just because you try and implement it doesn't mean initially that everything is going to go well and doesn't mean it, you don't need other tools. But what it says is, look, if I have a leaky pipe and I have a way to like this wrench to get that pipe so it doesn't leak anymore, I should make use of that. And if I don't know how to use this this wrench, or if I don't know that that's a leaky pipe, I should be able to call essentially the plumber and say, hey, how? what do you think is going on here? Say, well, did you look under the sink? Is that why you've got water on your floor? And that's why you should um, maybe you know get the wrench out. So it's just another tool in your toolbox. It is not a panacea. It's not as if we introduce EICU into settings and everybody is suddenly cured. That's not the case. Um, ICU mortalities continue in very high acuity settings outside of pandemics to approach you know, upwards of 30% in very high acuity settings. So you're still talking about high mortality situations, um, but it is a tool that I think has some potential benefit. And I think that's our last slide, if I'm not mistaken. Um, let me know if you have any questions, and uh, I will um, leave this up and uh, ask you guys to um, maybe unmute people as they have questions. Yes, I think yes, we can do Yeah. There are some questions already under the chat box and then the q and I don't know, Dr. Um, Lila, if you can see them. Okay, let's um, see. Um, yeah. Yep, I see Q&A and I see 88 questions. Oh my goodness. All right, we'll see what we can answer. We'll see what we can answer. Okay, so in the chat box real quick. So can the doctor do diagnosis from a distance? Absolutely, the doctor can do diagnosis from a distance and you type the answer. Um, hell yeah, hell yeah. That's the whole point of <laughs> the ICU, okay. Um, how can such kind of instruments be considered as a res uh, considered as resource limited setting? Um, so I think I showed you some tools. Um, uh, this may have come up uh, before I got to that part of the slide. Um, if that question is still present, I'll come back to it later. Um, currently launched app-based patient care services in Ethiopia like WeCare, is that a type of telemedicine? I'm not familiar with WeCare. Um, it, it may be, I'm, I'm just not familiar with uh, everything that's out there in terms of the market. Um, you know that Philips thing that I was talking about is is it's not it's not it's not realistic, right? In in most settings, even um, in the United States, in a lot of settings, it's not really realistic. But um, some version of telemedicine is probably realistic in almost all settings. Uh, then we've got a chat here. Okay, let's see. Let me um, let me get rid of this for a second. Why is my chat not showing? Hold on. Um, I can help you. Um, is it because I'm screen sharing the questions? I think you can see them. The, the very common team question has been on the message box has been, what has been the challenge implementing this in Ethiopia? Uh, even like, you know, lack of connectivity and maybe your experience working there, what was it like? 
so um, let me, sorry, let me, so what I would say the biggest deterrent to uh, implementation is the connectivity in Ethiopia. Um, the, that, that is why something like a WhatsApp program for at least the audio video or Telegram or whatever, they're not HIPAA compliant programs, right? But on, on some level, because the, the level of healthcare portability and accountability is not, I think, fully matured yet, you have a bit more wiggle room um, than we might uh, hear. Um, so let me just not minimize that for a second. So I, I, I think that the use of your mobile devices, whatever you have on hand is a legitimate way to implement telemedicine. You know, I'll give you an example. In, in I think June or July, I was back in Ethiopia and I was teaching the fellows at Black Lion how to do some procedures, right? Like central line placement, intubation. Um, and I told them, if you need anything, just call me. So I was there to do some other things as well. And so I got a call. Um, this is the more standard version of telemedicine. I got a call from one of the fellows, very good fellow who said, you know, I've got this patient who has, um, a fib. I think some of it might be related to volume depletion, and I, but I've given them volume. How do I know if they still need volume? So we had a conversation over the phone about how he could use um, hemodynamic parameters to make an assessment on uh, and patient positioning to make an assessment on the uh, volume status of the patient, having already given some fluid to this patient. Um, so th that you know, most of the time phones are working. So I would say that part of things is is relatively reliable. It's the internet connectivity that I think is going to be the biggest challenge. Um, and I think if institutions would make investments in improving their internet connectivity, then I think you could expand on the audiovisual component at the bedside. Um, I want to maybe answer a couple of these questions. Johannes Hailu asked, uh, if it, if it was a patient or a nurse asking for support from you, is that still EICU? Absolutely. Anyone who you give clinical advice to um, in, sorry, one second. Um, it, that is EICU because you're not physically present, but you're an ICU doctor providing those inter interventions. Um, involvement of the ICU doctor uh, protocol, how much can the, those doctors involve? I'm not sure I quite understand that question. Um, can you explain the difference between telemed and EICU? Oh yeah, so um, uh, Yohanan, uh, the difference is basically telemedicine can be as basic as a phone call and a cell phone. That is actually truly still telemedicine. EICU is the integration of audiovisual equipment in the ICU room at the bedside of the patient to communicate to uh, another location, right? That other location, like when I do telemedicine, I'm looking at hospitals that are, you know, 10, 15 miles away. You saw one 65 miles away that actually crosses state lines. There's um, providers in Israel covering the entire hospitals, uh, you know, that have contracts with them in the United States. So that, that's the basic difference is that um, ability to uh, see the audio visual feed and connect to the electronic medical record of those institutions. Uh, what are the medical legal implications with respect to uh, EICU? So um, are you medically liable as a EICU doctor? The answer is yes, you're still medically liable. Like if I say to a nurse as an EICU doctor, I want you to push um, 200 milliequivalents of IV potassium into that patient. That is homicide. By all accounts, that's homicide, right? And so, yes, I am medically, uh, I am legally liable as the EICU physician. If I um, refuse to act on a patient um, and, you know, I see that a patient is deteriorating and I refuse to advise the, the team at the bedside, that's also a medical legal. But on the whole, you are not the attending of record. That doesn't mean in the United States so that you won't get pulled into a lawsuit. Um, it's very rare for the EICU doctor to get pulled into to a lawsuit because you're actively trying to help. And most of the time, um, people tend to not pull in folks who are trying to help. And I think the medical legal implications in the Ethiopian healthcare context, I think are even less clear and less risky to be very honest. But the other one is around protections of patient privacy when you're um, using EICU. Um, Private practice. Uh, so I think if you can get connectivity with your electronic medical record in a private practice setting to um, whoever has the um, intensivist uh, contract with you guys, 
uh, I think that you have some real potential uh, to make that happen. So a lot of uh, electronic medical records don't have to be located physically at the location um, where the patient is. It opens up a whole world of possibilities because people are naturally biased to share information that they think is relevant to you. So they may only share, if they think, uh, I really think this patient's having an MI, I'll give you a classic example. We, we saw a patient walking through a hospital that I won't name, but it was in Ethiopia, a private hospital, that they were being treated for sepsis, postpartum patient being treated for sepsis. When we saw the patient, we thought, this is not sepsis. This is a patient who has postpartum cardiomyopathy. You need to diurese them. You need to um, start doing ventilator weaning trials. You need to stop sedating them and you need to try and get them extubated. They shouldn't remain on a ventilator very long, right? But if I had called and asked for the information, it is much more likely that they would have given me the information that supported the diagnosis of sepsis than all of the other things. So being able to access that information is cru uh, crucial. Um, got a lot of thank yous share questions. Um, limited internet access with frequent interruptions of networks due to <laughs> unstable politics. So again, I would say first start off with um, a, uh, a just a phone call, right? And then see if you need to escalate from there. Um, if you can't, if you, you should almost always be able to still, I think, connect with phone services in Ethiopia. Um, when you can't, I don't have an answer. I mean, there's not a great solution. I mean, a lot of this relies on some level of connectivity, at least minimal level of connectivity. Um, but I wouldn't hesitate also to use patients' families as resources. They often will have a phone. You can ask them, like, if you can't connect to the provider, hey, do you mind if I uh, use your phone to try and connect, right? Um, I would use whatever resource you have available. Limited number of mechanical ventilation equipment is one issue making it unavailable when it is needed. Um, Dr. Samuel, uh, I agree, not every place has mechanical ventilation. It's considered kind of one of the important hallmarks of ICU care. Um, and that I don't have a great answer for. I mean, there are more affordable ventilators, but truly almost all ICUs need to have a ventilator. Otherwise, they're really not an ICU. They're basically a floor patient of some sort. And this would maybe not be so appropriate um, in that setting. Um, yeah, power supply, right, and it is also an issue in our setting, right? So, you know, one thing I would tell you is that as, as institutions get set up, especially private institutions, they should be making some investment, some capital investment in connectivity, right? You have, yes, you have a building, but you should also put in things like a UPS, like an uninterrupted power supply so that these systems don't go down. Systems go down everywhere, right? There are downtimes in the United States for systems. That happens everywhere. There are violations of patient privacy, both intentional and accidental in the United States. So it's not as if these things don't happen. Um, in settings where supply is less reliable, you need to have redundancy built in, right? And so if the, if the institution puts in some systems, whether either through a generator, you should have un uninterrupted power supply so you don't fry your system as power comes on and off. Um, th those, are not in, those are not extraordinary capital investments to make. Um, I think that most institutions should be making them in order to have um, ongoing care be more supported. I mean, and, and there have been times when things like oxygen run out. I mean, how do you deal with that? I mean, there's there's there are some things you do not have an answer to. And I think EICU is not that answer. It is more intended where you have some basic resources for critical care already existing. And where you don't, to at least have a phone call and a mobile app to say, is this someone I should even send to you, right? If someone calls me from a remote outlying area with someone with an advanced age who's frail with hematological malignancy, that's not someone who's appropriate for ICU care. So transferring that patient away from that setting and their families is not gonna improve their survival and we should make that clear to people, but at least the ability to ask those questions is very important. Um, I think that's the beginning of questions here. Um, let me just see. Oh, there's 63 new questions. Okay, let me go down. Um, a lot of thank yous. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, 
Yeah, okay, this is about how to do your presentations. The, the one thing I'd like to say, because uh, it came up uh, as a question from uh, one of my now colleagues there, um, is, uh, is ICU in the ER an appropriate thing? And the answer is, the initiation of critical care services should happen wherever the patient is, right? If you have someone who needs pressors, um, whether it's norepinephrine or adrenaline, you need to initiate it wherever that patient is. You should not wait until they get to the ICU. You need to have someone who can stabilize the patient until a bed becomes available. So I'm all for that kind of thing. On the other hand, continuing those services in a setting that is not really staffed for ICU level care is not appropriate either for patient outcomes. So in our setting, um, the ICU team will either accept, deny um, after having seen or um, go down and physically, uh, uh, or at least accept just on the report from the ER within 30 minutes. That doesn't mean a bed is available immediately, but that means that the transfer of care goes from the um, ER doctor to the ICU doctor and the ICU team and the um, bedside nurse in the ER now is resourced to the ICU trained physicians to take care of these patients. And to the extent that they're taken care of, at least in the interim in, in the ER, the ER is providing extraordinarily valuable service, but that should not continue past the time when an ICU bed is actually available, because that's not how ERs are intended to work, right? You can't have both high and low acuity at the same time trying to be staffed effectively. It just doesn't work. Um, There's another question from Ayasu. Ayasu, okay. Is he in the Q&A? Yeah, he's in okay. Yeah. Okay. On the chat box, asking, uh, behind it's saying, okay. um, thank you, doctor. Thank you for bringing this. Is it this one here? Oh. Okay. I believe it's not a priority for us to. How, yeah, how do you see the feasibility of EICU for private practice in Ethiopia? Um, so is Iyasu saying he doesn't think that it's viable for Ethiopia? Was that his point, I think? How can question? we make it visible for private practices? Yeah. Yeah, so what I would say is uh, the, the context of, uh, ICUs are always hospital-based, right? And so the, a private hospital should make a determination about how much investment they wanna make in telehealth supporting their patients. This is often happening in the evenings, right? And so if the answer is, yes, we wanna make that investment, there are plenty of people doing design, uh, internet design throughout the world in affordable ways, app-based design in affordable ways. And until that time, unless you are prohibited um, from sharing your EMR with whoever you contract for additional support, um, who's an intensivist, then I think you can certainly start engaging with whatever app that you have that can show a video of that patient. I can't explain to you how important seeing a patient is in determining, and their data, in determining what to do for a patient. Um, and so if you can make the EMR available at a private hospital to someone at their home or to an office-based system, um, that is the first hurdle. And I think that's actually a very tackable hurdle. Um, you have larger private hospitals now um, that are more well-funded. Um, the smaller private hospitals may not even have an ICU. So it's not a realistic, it's not a realistic need. There is no ICU there to even provide EICU services for, but the larger ones are. And so the question is, what's the what's the deterioration of patients in the evening look like? How do they address that? And would it would there be benefit gained by having access to a, a telemedicine doctor uh, in the evenings? And there should be redundancy. If I can't get through because the camera goes down, the internet goes down, I make a phone call and I at least get help by phone, right? That is still telemedicine. Yes, thank you very much. Another question was uh, 50,000 to like 100,000 dollar USD uh, is like 2.5 to 5.2 million per, per bed. How could we manage this in the country like Ethiopia? 
Yeah, so you should definitely not make that, like it, it's not even realistic to consider that kind of capital investment, right? I mean, that money is better spent establishing an ICU program than on tele-ICU, right? Um, what you should invest in is, okay, what is a, a good EMR that we can count on to work? What are the backup systems so that the ER EMR does not go down? And how does that electronic medical record, that's what I mean by EMR, how does that, how can that be used outside of the physical facility where the patient is located? So if you can start with that, I think almost all facilities could afford a tablet and that holder that I'm describing, right? That whole solution is well under $1,000 US. And that is a lasting solution. Um, you just have to charge it. You just have to make sure it doesn't walk off. You can notice that there's clamps and often they're actually locked in and you need a code to take the tablet out. So, so no one can just walk off with your tablets. Excuse me. And so I think first focus on the electronic medical record and getting that to be portable for um, ICU doctors to see outside of the facility. Once you get that, then you can just start with something very basic. Um, and I think also this uh, World Telehealth um, Initiative, that organization um, would be a way to collaborate in low resource environments because their whole mission is to basically provide ICU talent and ICU level telemedicine equipment, not the, not the ventilator. They're not gonna provide you a ventilator. They're not gonna provide you infusion pumps. They're gonna provide you a robot that has the ability to have a camera that swings around and the ICU doctor remotely can see the patient in your location. Okay, there's Berekat has his hand raised. I'm gonna uh, go with Berekat and Seaside only because those are my brother's names. So go ahead and unmute them. They have a question, it looks like. <laughs> yeah, you can unmute yourselves and you can ask the question. Well, Berekat Abraham uh, has a question. Should be a good one because you're named after my older brother. Uh, he's still muted. What about Cisay as well? Yeah. We have raised five people. They raised their hands so they can ask their question. Whoever whoever unmutes first gets to go first. Okay, there's no there's nobody unmuting, so I think they might not be able to unmute. Have you guys allowed them to unmute? Yes, we did, yeah. We raised them to, to the floor so that they can unmute themselves and uh, ask the questions. Okay. But there were a few more questions on the Q&A section. Uh, yeah, one asked it. Uh, one asked Does patient need to consent for the ICU? No. Yeah. They also don't even need to consent for ICU care. Um, they technically need to consent for ICU procedures, but that's only when the procedures aren't emergent. If you show up at a hospital, you're assumed to need life-saving therapy and the provider provides life-saving therapy. But if it's something that is elective, then yes, they do need to consent, but not for the EICU. That's built into the, the hospital admission process. Okay, um, there was one question. I think you have addressed it at the start of your session, but if there's anything you can add. Uh, there is misconception with emergency-based ICU and telemedicine-based ICU. How would we clarify that? Right, um, let me, I saw that question. Misconception, emergency-based ICU, EICU, and telemedicine-based ICU, EICU, how would you clarify that, right? So again, um, EICU with a lowercase e is how we refer to the type of program that I'm describing, right? It's a telemedicine based uh, program in the ICU. Whereas emergency based ICU with the, I think they use a capital E is the initiation of ICU services in an emergency room. But when you look at the data for doing that, that data talks about doing it only until a bed is available in an ICU because you're not just missing the intensivist um, in the setting of the ER. Um, and, and ER physicians can be trained in critical care. It's a, usually an additional uh, one to two years of study. 
Um, but the, you're also missing the staffing ratio for uh, acutely ill patients and often a lot of the monitoring systems that are needed. And so you're talking about a um, group of patients that are um, you know, not being monitored by an ICU doctor. You'd be much better off having the ICU doctor available to the ER staff to help them care for the patient. So in our context, the ICU doctor, as soon as they get called by the ER to see a patient, unless they're busy with a very unstable patient in the ER, they go see the patient. And then that becomes the responsibility of the ICU. And in the, in the trials that I've seen, at least of emergency-based ICU, it's again, only until the, um, the actual ICU is open. Because what you're also talking about is you have to have one nurse staffing two patients. That's the standard for ICU level care in every, it, it, basically everywhere that is the standard. And that's if they're not high acuity. If they're very high acuity, like they've got a, a balloon pump or they have uh, inner um, intracranial pressure monitoring device or they're uh, someone who's deteriorated and uh, you know is not just ventilator dependent but needs um, acute dialysis in addition that's you know continuous dialysis the, the staffing for that is like one nurse per patient when you try and take that kind of resource out of the ER they literally don't have the capacity to do it so and if you move the ICU nurse down to the ER unless you have adequate ICU staffing from the nursing perspective you also are not, the staffing is not built for that. Um, thank you very much, Doc. Uh, yeah, no I think we can, yeah, we can uh, start uh, discussing about the uh, questions. And we can turn on the answers. Let's give them a few more minutes so that they'll be able to finish. So, oh, are this for, yeah, for mm -hmm. the attendees who we have shared it before. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'll just um, stop my video share for just one second while they're working on that. How do I see critical care? That's a very uh, good question. So, um, you know, I, I think it's going very well from the initiation of training um, to the level of services being offered now. Um, I think it's still more fragmented than it needs to be. Uh, and I think that um, the, the, you know, in general, are we meeting um, a lot of protocol driven, data driven outcomes? Um, I think that could be improved. I, I think the other thing that I've seen is really problematic to me is there is um, a, a sense that everything should be done for everybody when that's not appropriate. It's, it's medically futile care that I often see being um, you know, executed. And I think a model that looks a bit more like what happens in Europe where physicians can say, yeah, it's not appropriate to offer this level of care. Um, I think that probably makes more sense than you know, everyone has a shot uh, if they're critically ill to uh, come into the ICU. That's not necessarily an appropriate um, standard to follow. Hey, Dr. Lilai, was, was this um, EICU being tested just only in Black Line or the project plan to expand to like some rural hospitals in Ethiopia where they have uh, dire need for intensive care? Um, so the training program is at Black Lion, but the fellows that have been trained have um, uh, been serving throughout the country. So uh, one of our wonderful fellows was in Makale. Uh, we have another, uh, we have a lot of fellows in Addis. Um, we have a, a fellow that had been down in Nazareth. We have a fellow that remains in Bahardar. Um, so they're, you know, they're being uh, sort of deployed throughout the country to fulfill um, the obligations of their commitment for service. Um, a lot of people want to come back to the capital, uh, so we have a lot of fellows who have returned back. Um, and unfortunately, you know, with the um, political events that happened in uh, Tigray, the I think a lot of the critical care in that setting is just a black box. We don't really know what's happened anymore. 
Um, it would be nice if it's possible to expand both critical, to do critical care training expansion, both at the physician level as well as the um, nursing level, right? Um, and ideally, you know, a critical care unit has also a pharmacist who's um, well-trained, uh, a, a case manager, like social worker to help with the disposition of patients, um, you know, and supporting of families. Um, and they're present in multidisciplinary rounds. Um, I think the other area that could actually improve a lot is the empowerment of the nurses, um, because you know, in, in the ICU setting, a, a well-trained nurse is just a real asset to both the patient and um, the physician. And so empowering the nurses to um, you know, do more than just documentation, but also start to think about like, you know, what could be going on in this patient as they're deteriorating or what are the things that I need help with? I think that that's um, the areas that I think could really use some improvement um, in, in the setting of this. Thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, uh, Akhlila was asking if it would be possible to get your contact. And uh, another question was, uh, what are the medical legal implications with respect to EICU? What are the medical, the medical what? What are the medical legal implications with respect to EICU? Yeah, so again, the, the can, you, can you be sued as a, a doctor who is participating in care through telemedicine? The answer is yes. Um, that is, I don't think there have been any cases even in the United States, to my knowledge, that have been brought in that setting because that's someone who's like actively participating to help with the care of the patient. But every country has different legal standards, right? And so um, you know, physician uh, legal risk in the U.S. is a very different kind of uh, environment than what you have in Ethiopia. I mean, it's very low risk in Ethiopia, um, and it's much higher risk in the United States. And even with that, telemedicine is still relatively a very low risk engagement for physicians. Okay, thank you. Uh, we can proceed with the questions. Uh, you gave us and answering them. Okay, just give me two seconds to open it up. Give me one second. Okay. Yeah. Attendees are saying uh, thank you for your excellent presentation. Thank you, I, I appreciate it. It's uh, my pleasure to share a little bit of knowledge. I, look, this is an area um, that I'm trying to at least give exposure to. There's not a lot of data, right? There's a lot that we do that is data-driven in medicine. There's a lot that is not data-driven that we still do. I would say this is an area that is far less data driven in a resource constrained environment. Um, but do we know that timely interventions to help patients who are able to um, benefit are life saving? Yes. And so that's what this is the basic premise of uh, EICU is that. Okay. And then are you guys sharing the screen for the questions or should I share it? Oh, if you have it, it would be better if you can share it. We sure. put it in Google form, yeah. Yeah, let me share. And I'll just share with the answer if you, if that's okay with you. Yes, we have uh, closed the form, so now we can discuss the questions and answers together. Okay, give me one second to pull it up. Sorry about that.
Okay, and can you guys see my screen? Can you guys see this? Okay. Um, so which of the components are not necessary for EICU? So um, the answer here is a residency program. Yes, you need a bedside provider. Yes, you need AV equipment for two-way communications that distinguishes it from telemedicine, broadly speaking. And yes, you need an intensivist. Um, the, a residency program is not at all necessary to do it. If there's a residency program, you'll actually find that the EICU doctor can also serve as a, um, and nurses can serve as educators to that residency program. And there's another way that telemedicine is used, but um, is not necessary for EICU. Um, which of the following leads to best practice for EICU? Um, significant financial investments in technology, um, checklist implementation, low level ad adoption by bedside providers and ANC. Um, this looks like dots, but this is supposed to be ABC. I don't know why it translated like this, I apologize. Um, and so checklist implementation is always about best practice. I mean, again, not the glamorous part of critical care, um, but uh, in fact, doing the um, bundles for and checklists for critical care are the things that um, need to improve survival almost above everything else. Um, Low level of adoption by the bedside provider. We've talked about how that is much less effective than you're basically using a very expensive set of tools to do very little, and that's never an effective strategy. Um, and then also significant uh, financial investments in technology. If that comes from a top down approach and is not adopted well by the institution and the provider specifically in that institution, again, it will not be particularly effective. Um, which of the following is false? Um, EICU is a form of telemedicine. We've talked about that that's true. Um, you've used telemedicine in your practice. So any of you have ever called somebody else and asked about clinical help, <laughs> then you have used telemedicine. Um, it may not be ECU, but you've used telemedicine. What I really wanna encourage you to think about is that this is something that you're already using to some extent. Um, mobile apps reduce hardware cost of EIC implementation. That's absolutely true. Um, you know, it's literally downloading something on a device that most people already have. Most people already have a mobile phone, download an app. Um, and then the U.S. is the only market where um, EIC has been implemented. That's not the case. It's been implemented in a lot of markets uh, throughout the world um, and could be also implemented in Ethiopia, I think, um, given appropriate um, really, I guess, uh, initiative would be the right word, like entrepreneurial um, and uh, medical initiative. Um, which of the following is true of EICU and resource constrained environments? It's not possible. Um, definitive benefits in terms of ICU and hospital mortality needs to be studied. That's what's actually true. Um, patient privacy protections are not needed. They are needed still. Um, if I'm, especially if you, if even not, forgetting even an app-based approach, if you just take the patient and you're videoing them and you're in a uh, unit that has multiple patients and someone else is next to them, you have to be conscious of the fact that you're not trying to get that, uh, you're not um, getting that other person in the screenshot. Otherwise, suddenly someone is seeing it. And if, you know, if the doctor happens to be out and not at their house when they're looking this stuff up and someone else sees that, that's not, that's not protecting the next patient's privacy. Um, and it allows for communication between physicians only. No, actually it can be very effective to communicate with the, the bedside nurses. It can be very effective to communicate with the patient's families. It can be very effective to communicate with um, pharmacy and other support personnel. Uh, so, you know, it's definitely not a physician to physician only communication tool. So if you answer definitive benefits need to be studied, then in the resource constrained environment, the answer to that question is yes. I think that's it. Thank you very much, Doc. Um... It was too easy for you. Hannes Hailu, good. I, I wanted to make sure you're paying attention. <laughs> you thought it was too easy for you. <laughs> I think it was a very well attended uh, webinar. We have almost 200 plus participants, one of our most attended CME so far. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's a great topic. Hopefully, we'll see more of this expanded throughout Ethiopia.
Yeah, and I think the if I were if I were a doctor and I wanted to make this happen, I would start talking to people who do um, app design in Ethiopia. That's what I would be doing. I would be talking to the people who do EMR design in Ethiopia, because you don't have time to develop an entire system yourself. By and large, you can work with people who do it, but you you are not going to. That is not your talents. <laughs> Those are not the things that you're trained in. You're better off seeing how you can implement protocols for good care. Unless you want to step aside from clinical care for a while, um, it's not an easy thing unless you have a whole team dedicated behind you. And you may see that come up in the future where the physician is acting as like the chief medical officer in a telehealth kind of company, but their actual um, skill set is still medical. It's not, it, you know, it's not developing an app so much. Yeah, there are actually some interesting apps developing in Ethiopia. So I think the one they mentioned where actually probably can increase access to some patients who can call their doctors, kind of like a, a consultancy thing where they reach out to their primary care or any care provider. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and there are some things already undergoing, so it's a good start. Yeah. So does we care? Um, does we care kind of fall in those lines? I think that's one of the apps that are being used. I know like there are two or three the uh, where you know physicians you know from their home or office are able to be accessed by patients and you know they get consultation direct from home. I think yep. those apps can be uh, bridge the gap between the AICU and you know the connectivity issues we have. I think that, that can be a good tool. Yeah. So, but recognize that that's still um, an audiovisual equipment that could then be implemented in an ICU setting. So you're 100 yeah. right. Um, yeah. what's obviously missing is if you're at home, you weren't sick enough to require all that yeah. monitoring. Yeah. But, you know, in the U.S., we used it right here in Philly. They use it for monitoring diabetes. They use it for monitoring congestive heart failure patients at home. So the home application of this has also been proven to try and minimize readmissions into hospitals, too. The one question I had, though, was like, how is the patient load like for, a per for the intensivist uh, monitoring patients from like, how many patients do you monitor? Is it too much or? Um, it can be a lot. Uh, generally, um, like in the um, INOVA system in uh, Virginia, we're probably monitoring, one physician is monitoring four to five different hospitals. Um, and so you're monitoring probably 60 to 80 patients at a time. Um, and, but you're not looking at every patient at all times, right? Because you have, you know, two nurses in there with you who are also triaging those patients and then um, you're, you know, managing it. I, I've never felt like it's undoable. Um, it definitely, you know, tests your ability to multitask, to be very honest, um, but it's not undoable. But that, that was one of the things I wanted to emphasize. It's not like because you have this, you have instant access to the physician. There's still a triage system that needs to happen, um, which is different than like a home-based consultation where you, know, you have immediate access as soon as you've signed up, you can access on an appointment. This is a setting where you still need to triage this limited resource, which is the intensivists and their knowledge base. Excellent, okay. Uh, Saga, um, if, if you have a, a final message, maybe we, we can give the floor again to Dr. Lilai to say final words, and then Saga can wrap up the session for us. I, I don't hear from Saga, but uh, Dr. Lilai, maybe you can, you can give a final message before we close it. Look at this, Abe Shumete. That's my Dr. Ababa from uh, Bahardar. Oh, so nice to see you on this uh, Q and A. He's one of my first fellows, actually. So that's wonderful to see. Oh, nice. <laughs> Do you have a means to support us at Bahardar? We already started training. Hey, oh. uh, send me an email, Abe. <laughs> Ababa, you know my email address. Just send me an email. It was a great right. session. Thank you. Most of the attendees were grateful. Uh, we'll be hoping to see you again in another session. It was my pleasure. Thank you, guys. And uh, it's a great organization that's uh, doing um, you know, education for uh, people. Ongoing medical education is vital for folks to stay abreast of uh, you know, improvements in patient outcomes, basically. How do you provide good patient outcomes? So bravo to Yitinawag. 
thank you so much. We'll be sending you maybe an email shortly to, you know, just to introduce you about Yeti Network. We're giving a talk to other physicians in the US too. Hopefully we'll okay. see you there as well. Because uh, we do like a broad uh, work and all is done by a volunteer network. People who are here and uh, like we have like one, 130 volunteers, even uh, wow. most of them in Ethiopia. That's wonderful. Yeah, no, I'm actually right now currently based in South Africa, um, oh. and I go back and forth between uh, South Africa, the U.S., and uh, Ethiopia. Okay, great. And it actually, the the more the merrier. Yeah, teleeducation. <laughs> wonderful. And then uh, Daniel said, "As a country, we need a biomedical to engage on some kind of technology." Yeah, um, I don't disagree with that. Uh, but someone's already putting together EMRs. I know that there's at least two or three different companies that I've already spoken to about EMRs. I don't think it would be such a stretch to have them start engaging in app development for you guys. I think, look, it's a business opportunity at the end of the day, right? And they're a business, they're gonna wanna potentially see what they can do. And then you can see what other apps exist out there. We Care sounds like they, they would have a natural market entry. Yeah. All right, thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much again. Thank you for uh, being with us on uh, your Saturday morning and for everyone who attended our session. Uh, we'll see you in another CME session. Have a great Saturday. All right. Take care. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.